Okay, now, the next thing we're going to do is take either your little printed copy of the self-confrontation manual, that little one, or uh, if you have it, if you actually have the course book, um, not, not the workbook, but the, the big book, the, the real book. Did we even get the real books? Does anybody have the real book? There we go, the big fat one. Okay, hold it up, there you go, see it? The big fat one. Turn in that thing to page three, right here. Page three, and uh, John, yes. They have workbooks. They don't have. They don't have real books. Unless they have their own. Nobody has the. Nobody's gotten good. Well, then I brought a copy. Good. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, we do have copies. Copy. Oh, yeah. It's either the little printed ones that, that you got or the big ones. The ones that are printed say. What does it say across there? Stolen. Provisional. That is too small to read, so I'm going to, here, I'll show it to you, here. Um, let, let me, this is, this is where we're going to be getting to. Lesson one, you can change biblically. Uh, but for those of you that have the provisional copy, I want to read a few things to help you understand uh, this course, because, uh, let me back up to, um, on page three, in the uses, it says, the purpose of this manual, and, and it's in the provisional copy on page three, it's micro fine print. And if you found page three in your provisional copy, say yes. Okay, so that's very few of you, so I'll read loud. The purpose of this manual is to teach you how to examine yourself biblically so that you can live in a manner that pleases the Lord and helps others do the same. Uh, if you turn the page, there's a little tiny microscopic picture of someone uh, there we go. You see in the upper left corner there's kind of a fellow sitting there. I thought most people would like to know who wrote this book that most of you don't have. Uh, I'll give you the thumbnail, what I know about him, and then I'll read this. He was the founder of the Far East Broadcasting Company, and that was in 1948 as World War II was ending, and as the communists were taking over China, he was in Shanghai, and he began broadcasting from Shanghai the gospel into all of China, Russia, and India. That, he started FEBC, if you're into missions. It's still around today. They broadcast the gospel 700 hours a day. Uh, in other words, they have so many gospel uh, transmitters that they can uh, have them broadcasting uh, all different ones throughout the day. But Dr. Broger that you see there was a missionary and an evangelical leader for 50 years. Uh, he started FEBC and he worked with that until the United States government Defense Department hired him to take over the defense communications uh, ministry. And so he did that for 23 years. And, and these materials that you're going to sooner or later get were, if you read all this, the two columns here, were the materials that he prepared and taught to the chaplains. So think about it. This is from the 40s and the 50s and the 60s before America, you know, disavowed all use of the Bible and prayer. This is the material that was used by the U.S. chaplaincy in counseling our soldiers that are now committing suicide at an alarming rate of, what, two a day or three? Some, I'm not saying they're getting killed in Afghanistan, I'm saying they're killing themselves. They are so despondent. And so that's who brokered. So if you want to know who started this course, he was a missionary who began what is still existing today. His radio stations are still broadcasting all over the Orient. And in the last 12 months, they have gotten letters from one and a half million people who have said, we have made decisions for Christ listening to your radio show. Now, isn't that astounding? Uh, and, and this material is what he discipled them in the early years. Okay, keep turning uh, to page 12 in your provisional, uh, the purposes of this course. And in the future, um, when all the books come, and I'm so sorry they haven't come, but we overwhelmed them. Uh, you know, all the courses start up in the fall of people that take this. And when we ordered our 140 copies, they said, 
We don't have any left. Of course, you know, we didn't do our sign-ups in time. We should have signed up in January, uh, you know, and had you all worry about this all the time. But I'll just read to you instead. The purpose of this course, the uh, second paragraph, the only complete sor source that identifies us the causes and provides solutions to all of life's problems is the Bible. Now, you understand, that's what this course is based on. Uh, we have two parts of this. We have a non-material part and a material part. The material part can be cared for well physically by the medical community. The non-material part can be cared for, but the only, listen to what this says, the only complete resource that identifies in the, the causes and provides solutions to all of life's problems is from the manufacturer. You understand that? That the Bible is the only thing that can cure, I didn't say physical illnesses, I'm talking about spiritual struggles. Only the Bible is the source that can meet that need. And that's the premise of this course. Of course, um, it gives a little overview of the Bible. The next paragraph, this course presents the essential biblical principles that can change your life. How do you like Deb Cruz's testimony? It's almost like an advertisement for the course. She said she was successful, and what, what else did you say, Deb? Um, everything but was empty. You see, only the scriptures can fill that part of us that God designed to be empty apart from him. And, and that is true not only for salvation, but after. Uh, the purpose of this course, if you look down the middle of that page, uh, 12 or uh, Roman numeral 7 is at the bottom. Uh, I want to go to point 2, to prepare to help you and others face and deal with their problems biblically. The paragraph, the self-confrontation course is built on biblical principles for living. They are biblical principles that provide patterns for living a victorious and contented life. Now look up for a minute, let me tell you something. One of the most famous authors in the scripture, the Apostle Paul said, I have learned to be content. Did you know contentment is a learned way of life? And the Bible teaches us the principles that lead to true contentment. Did you know our entire American advertising uh, media is driven by discontent? You need to have whiter teeth. You need to have smoother, glossier hair, if you have hair. Uh, you need to have a, you know, a better car. You need to have, you know what I mean? You watch it, and, and right down to cereal, right down to everything. It's, it's driven by, you need to get a better one. You need to get the iPhone 5. I mean, you don't want to be an old buddy-duddy with a four, right? Right, I mean, that's right now, the news said that the gross domestic product of America is gonna go up because so many people are gonna buy an iPhone 5. You know why? Because our society is built on discontent, that you are behind if you don't have the newest. And so, we have to learn the principles for contented life, the second line, keep reading that paragraph, and are applicable to the young, the elderly, the poor, the wealthy, the healthy, and the ill, and the skilled, and the unskilled. These biblical principles apply to all of life's circumstances in any culture and in every part of the world, regardless of age, which one lives. Uh, why can you say that? Well, because the Bible says it, but also because Mr. Broger taught these in Southeast Asia, in Northern Asia. He taught them over the air with FEBC. And this is actually the counseling material that he used to counsel uh, so many people in the world that had no regular, open, free, above ground local church. So it's just fascinating to think of this material, how long uh, he practiced all this stuff. Okay, the next paragraph. Each lesson is designed first to explain the meaning of specific biblical principles. We're going to get in that tonight. I'm going to show you in our little copy that I, I have in here uh, that is much bigger than the little one you have, uh, the principles, and then to build them into your life through very practical homework assignments. And I will explain the homework. I know some of you wanted to know the homework a month ago. You know, there's two kinds of people. The people that take it as it comes, and the other people want to be all done before it starts. You know what I mean? And, uh, and for those of you that like to have everything done ahead of time, I'm sorry. We don't even have the books. But I'm going to explain the homework, which is very simple. It's just spending 
to do everything that this book says you're supposed to do, according to them, only takes 10 to 12 minutes a day. Now, when I wrote this book, I said 20 minutes to a half hour. That's because you might, you know, sip coffee between, you know? But to do everything this course takes is predicated on 12 and a half to 15 minutes, literally, in their calculations. And I say 15 to 20, and then don't sweat it, take a half hour if you want. Okay, uh, practical homework assignments. Next sentence. The course consists of 24 lessons usually taught in two hour classes a week. That's how come we can do it, because we're teaching it a lot slower than them. Uh, the first eight lessons consist of principles describing how change takes place. So we're doing one lesson a month instead of one lesson a week. That's why they say you need an hour a day to do the homework, and I say you only need 15, because we're doing it at one-fourth the speed. And why I say that is, there are 140 of us here. The first time I taught this in Tulsa, we had 200. And we did it a chapter a week. And it was, it was uh, we had a few Zantax moments, uh, or whatever, Zantac, whatever it's called, you know. Uh, because people were so committed, they couldn't even underline the verses that fast. I mean, there are hundreds of verses to highlight in your Bible. And so I decided, then the second time we taught it, we spread it out over, instead of doing it in six months, as you're supposed to, we did it in 12. And it was Valium moments, you know. I mean, it, it, we've gone from heartburn to stress. And so now we've spread it out over two years. And by the way, it's in semesters. Okay, keep looking down. The eight lessons provide a foundation for the next 14 lessons, which deal with some of the most common problems of life. The last two lessons are review. So what he said is, for the first eight months in this course, we're going to deal with foundational things. You say, wait a minute, I want to get into counseling. That is counseling. Did you know understanding how people are wired is much better than probing at problems that you aren't sure where they emanate from. Understand, it's like looking for a short in your car, you know, the electrical system? Yeah, we can just tear the whole thing out, drop in a new engine, and, or but just buy a new car. But with people, you can't do that. You have to trace, you know, if you're, like my daughter's electrical got eaten up by a gopher. And so, in our yard, one of the problems for living in law, you know, uh, and so what they're doing is they're checking every connection like this because she doesn't want them to sell her a new car. And did you know the first eight chapters are, of this book are about checking all the connections of our spiritual life. And if you stick with it, you'll actually understand how we are wired biblically. Okay, the objectives of this course, you can expect to learn the following. The biblical uh, principles for understanding problems from God's point of view. You understand, this is, this, is, this is built upon using the scriptures to see how God describes our problems. And did you know for many of us, we have, we have for so long in our lives, from childhood, I mean I went through Hazlitt Public School and I went to Michigan State University, and, and in, in those years, I don't think I heard anybody except Mrs. Hahn, my kindergarten teacher, that happened to be a Christian, ever describe problems from God's perspective. Where does everyone describe it from? Human, man's perspective. So this is a very incredible thing to understand problems from God's point of view. Second bullet, to gain hope in every situation. We are purveyors of hope. It says in 2 Corinthians 1, in fact, take your Bibles for a minute. This is one of the verses you're going to highlight. If you want to start your highlighting, you can do it now. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 is perhaps the most hopeful chapter in the Bible. But if you've never discovered this verse, it's good to mark it when you get your highlighters. You can highlight it. Um, and by the way, someone asked me about highlighters, so I brought my favorites tonight. Uh, I'm a collector of highlighters. Uh, I told someone by email today that I like the pigment ones. This is a zebra zazzle, Z-A-Z-Z-L-E. But what you look for are the kind that are pigments that they sit on top of the page so they don't bleed through so that you're highlighting both sides of the page. You know, it's very hard in your Bible. It's such thin paper unless you have a funny Bible. But if you have a normal Bible, the paper is so thin, 
that you're highlighting both sides of the page at the same time. And so pigment ones, and they usually say, it actually says on there, liquid pigment ink. What that means is it sits on the surface and dries. It doesn't soak in. It's, it's designed for, for our kind of paper. And there's, so Zebra Zazzle makes one, and so does Sanford Liquid Accent. That's another pigment one. Um, and then these 4A ones are not as good. They try and evaporate. You know, you go like that and you go like this, and they try and evaporate before it goes through. I don't like this one as much because it goes halfway through, and so it confuses me. So I stay with liquid pigment ones. Uh, or what I really like, because those are not good on airplanes. They leak on airplanes. And so I don't like them because they ruin everything in your briefcase. So if you travel, I get the actual fluorescent yellow uh, crayon highlighters. And you can buy those at Office Depot, Office Max. They're just little tiny fluorescent crayons inside of a dispenser, and then they don't leak on airplanes. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. See, I've used mine. Can anybody see in the back how yellow that is? Those are the verses for this course. Do you see how many there are on one page? That's why you're going to see it's hard to do the homework. That's why we spread it out. We don't want you to get frustrated. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are, what does it say? Comforted, yeah, by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation, it's the same word for comfort, abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings, which we also suffer, I'm in verse 6, in the middle. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation, and our hope of you is steadfast, because we know that you are partakers of the sufferings, so you also partake in the consolation. Do you see how often that word comfort, 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 comfort comes up? This is the most hopeful section. You notice all the absolutes in here? It says, he is the God of all comforts in verse 3. He comforts us in all our tribulation in verse 4, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. Those are pretty absolute. He didn't say some, a few, maybe, now and then. He says all, everyone, in all. You understand that only God can make those kind of claims. You know, it, it would be one thing for somebody to say, well, I've got this, and it'll cure most things. God says, I have something that will comfort everyone, anyone, with any problem. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 7. You should highlight that and think about that in the days ahead as we're looking at how people are wired because the God of comfort and the God of mercy is the only one that can comfort anyone in any trouble with the comfort only he gives. So that is a very hopeful verse. Okay, back to your little books or your provisionals or whatever you have. Uh, the characteristics and practical importance of the biblical homework, we'll get to that. Now look at the top of the next page if you have this. Biblical principles pertinent to dealing with self-belittlement. What you're going to learn in this course is there are two forms of pride. And, and you know what? All of a sudden you'll start noticing it. Uh, we notice it in ourselves. We notice it in others. One kind of pride is this kind. Oh, don't look at me. Don't think about me. I'm nothing. No, no, no. I would never do that. I'm nothing. What are you doing? You're drawing attention to yourself. As much as going out and say, I know everything. I can do anything. Try me. You see, there's two forms of pride. There's this self-belittlement, then there's the self-exaltation, and then there's the stepchild to the self-belittlement, and it's kind of a combination of both, and it's self-pity. And, and did you know, if you start studying this, especially in Proverbs, you will see every one of these people out there, because you start noticing it. They're the people that, that always, in the conversation, they work it in so you feel sorry for them. And there's others that are always going, oh, don't look at me, but they say it so much, you are looking at them. And then there's the ones we all don't like, and they just think they're great. Uh, middle bullet, personal difficulties such as greed. You know, most of us don't realize down deep how greedy we are since we were little. 
Remember I told you the story of two-year-olds poking the cupcakes? Because they want them all? It, it doesn't end. I, I've done three or four hundred funerals in my lifetime. Do you know how many families are fighting over the stuff while we're working on the funeral? That's my dresser. She left it for me. She left it for me. I mean, I'm saying, what's your favorite hymn? She left it for me. They're talking during the thing. Greed is so much a part of the way we're wired. And even death of our loved one doesn't seem to deter it at all. Envy. Wow. Uh, a lot of people don't like to tell other people they got a new car because everybody gets upset at them because they wish they got a new car. Envy. Anger. I mean, that's, that's underlying. Bitterness. We don't call it bitterness. We say they hurt me. And we don't get over it. And God calls it bitterness. Depression, fear, worry. And then relationships. Uh, talks about interpersonal. By the way, I've already told you this. Galatians 5 lists off the top 15 manifestations of the flesh. More than half of them are in interpersonal relationships. Outbursts of anger and wrath and, and cutting words and all that. Relationships. And then we talk about principles having to do with life down the sins. Materials needed for this course, you need a literal translation of the Bible. There are four very common ones. The English Standard is one. Uh, the New American Standard is another. The New King James is another. And so is the Old King James. The NIV is not literal. It's good. It's especially good in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew. But it's not literal. And what you want to do is get as close as you can in counseling to the words. See, that the NIV is not... Every word of the NIV is not sitting on top of a Greek or Hebrew word. And, and so that's a problem if in this book, as we're talking about Hebrew and Greek words and the meanings of them, the NIV has moved the words off from mooring on, and they're moving it more and more uh, in each edition that comes out. So it's OK to have a, an NIV. I have many NIVs. It's the finest rendering of the biblical Hebrew that's ever been done, NIV is. It follows the Hebrew better than anybody else because they got the, the best Old Testament team that was viable. But it doesn't adhere to literal translation principles. So it's, it's a challenge, OK? So you need that. You need the manual, which is coming. And you need a concordance. Now, someone I told this week, and I'll tell all of you, my favorite concordance I keep in my pocket. It costs 99 cents. And I can look up any word in the Bible on my phone. And I use it all day long. Because a concordance is about this big. You know, it's, it's bigger than two telephone books. But you can get a, a and there are many of them. Um, I just use one for the New King James. But you can find them in, uh, in the app stores uh, if you want one. But you need a concordance, either a fat, heavy one or an electronic one. Uh, OK, real quickly, um, your commitment on discipline of this course, you can read that. Uh, your manual for the course, look at the bottom. Uh, the, it says this manual is divided into two sections and lessons, 24 lessons. But the next sentence is important. You must read the referenced verses in your Bible for a more complete understanding. What I would caution you to do is, and, and I'll show you what I mean right here. Uh, let's go to uh, what we're going to be working on in a minute, but I'll show you what I mean. Look, look at, um, um, I better go to the next page before they start doing it. There are constant, look at this. You probably can't see that, but these are all references. I mean, they're just bazillions of them. Did you know that, that the more of those you look up in, in each of the lessons, the more you'll get out of this course. Now, you don't have to look up every one of them. What I did, the first time I took this course, I just did every other one because, remember, we were doing it you know, uh, once a week, and it was impossible. But as you go through this course, what you'll find is they repeat a lot of these verses all the way through. And so if you've already marked 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy 3, but you haven't marked 2 Peter, then you can do that one. But what I do is, from every section, it's better, instead of skimming this course, if you're, if you're doing the course, at least look up every other verse reference, even if you don't get your homework done. It's better to learn something than to just 
buzz through this. So um, that's, let's see. I'm glad my wife's not here. She never likes me to talk to the smart board. She said it's dumb to talk to a smart board. Okay, turn the page to uh, uh, page 17, and now we're going to start, and let's see, we have, good, we have 10 minutes to go through um, this first lesson. So let me get to page 17. You should be here. And um, it looks like this. And this is our, our theme verse that we're all working on. And what we're looking on tonight and next week, you can change biblically. And we're going to define what change is and what the Bible says. This verse is going to be part of our homework. This is the verse we're memorizing. This is a verse that we're supposed to be putting in our own words. Uh, for by grace we have been saved. It's through faith. We can't do it ourselves. It's a free gift. It isn't based on anything we've done. And God doesn't like us to boast about it. But you can just put it into your own words. Now, go to the next page. And we're going to start. Um, this, is, this is how lesson one begins. With Every lesson has this initial box, which is the, the overview of the lesson. And what it says is, the most significant decision you will ever make concerns your willingness to follow God's plan for your life as revealed in the Bible. Uh, I can't emphasize that enough. Did you know all of us were born wanting to follow our own plan? Isaiah 53, 6. You all know it? Let's say it. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. You ever see children wanting their own way? And if they can't have their own way, they they turn over the game board, right? You ever seen someone do that? They'd rather destroy the game and knock everybody's pieces off than have it not go their way. And it's not, we just get more refined in how we do that the older we get. Um, that's why, I mean, people quit. They'll quit jobs if they, I mean, it's just ingrained in us. So this course, this whole first month, the most significant decision not the people you're counseling will ever make is about our willingness to follow God's plan for our life. Now, I know a lot of people, they want to know God's plan for their life. What they don't realize is God speaks through the Bible. It's through the Bible. And, and the Holy Spirit speaks through Scripture. So the more verses you know, the more his vocabulary increases. You understand that? It's amazing how God leads us, showing us his plan through the Bible. This decision directly impacts your daily life and eternal destiny. By the way, Jesus said that he's going to say someday to a group of people, they're going to be in front of him, and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things? And you say, yep, but I never knew you. You see, you, you knew God's plan, but you never decided, you were never willing to follow me. See, Luke says it clearly, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? See, the willingness to follow God's plan is all about our eternal destiny. We have to bow to him. That's what the whole idea of salvation is. That I say, Lord, I can't save myself. And you're the only one that can save me. And so instead of following my plan, I'm going to follow yours. And so that same, how did Paul put it? He says, as you've received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk ye in him. The same way that we get saved, our eternal destiny, is how we live our daily life. Okay, uh, goes through the purposes of this lesson. Then it goes through the, the overview of the whole week uh, of study. And now it goes to the next page. So page 19. And... Uh, Get it up here, and this is uh, this isn't the best copy I've ever seen of this thing, uh, but at least it gives us a focal point. Again, same structure, big box at the top. God enables you to take the first steps toward lasting biblical change. Now we're back to the R of grow. Reach out to the Holy Spirit. 
Did you hear Deb say that in your testimony tonight? I didn't know what she was going to say. She said, I didn't know about the Holy Spirit. Did you know there are many people trying to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit's presence in their lives? They are churchy. They are religious. They are unempowered. They're kind of like a radio with a cord not plugged into the wall. It just doesn't work. Any appliance, with, unless it's an electric, but an electrical appliance that's not plugged in is beautiful, and it looks like it's all there. It just doesn't have any power. Without the Holy Spirit, without God enabling us, we can't have lasting change. You see, people can change all the time. It just doesn't last, because only God makes lasting change. And this step is your response to God's demonstrated love for you in Christ Jesus. Remember, uh, God commends his love toward us. Uh, in, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, now, here's the first principle. Now, this whole course is built around these principles, and you'll see them in every lesson. God's plan for you to change in a biblical way centers on his son, Jesus Christ. Because God's standard is one of perfection... Uh, Leviticus 19 says, you shall be holy as I am holy. Uh, Matthew 5.48 says, be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Because God's standard is one of perfection, we cannot meet it by our own efforts. Remember, we all have sinned and fall short of God's standard. So, you cannot save yourself, nor depend on any other human being to redeem you. You need to recognize your helplessness to meet God's standard and need to repent of your sin. You know what repentance is? It's a change of mind. It starts, metanoia, means a change of mind that leads to, that change of mind leads to a change of behavior. Now see, it says in 2 Corinthians, can you quote 2 Corinthians in there? Uh, 2 Corinthians 7 that godly sorrow works repentance. And, and so this we come under conviction of our sin by the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit's convicting us. And our sorrow, and our, our godly sorrow, works repentance. So it's a change of behavior. And so understanding our helplessness to meet God's standard causes us to repent. And by God's grace and mercy, you recognize your lost condition. You believe wholeheartedly and sincerely on the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving the gift of eternal life and forgiveness of your sins. What has he just gone through? The plan of salvation. You say, why? Because the first thing, did you know I, I run an evangelistic wedding outfit? People, this is a big church. People come by and want to get married. In fact, just this week, uh, someone said, uh, someone called the church and they want to get married here. They said, who wants to meet with them? Nobody said anything. I said, I'll meet with them. You know why? I always say, hey, thanks for coming. Why to get married here? Do you know being married is the second greatest day of your life? Mm-hmm. And they look at me and they say, second? This isn't our second marriage. I said, no, 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 no. I didn't say second marriage. I said the second greatest day of your life. Did you know I just led to the Lord a couple that stopped by here, wanted to use our chapel to do their 50th. I said, I'd love to do your 50th renewal. I said, come out of my office. Shut the door. And I said, now, you're renewing the second greatest day of your life. And this 72-year-old man looked at me and said, second greatest day? He said, I've been married to the most wonderful woman in the world for 50 years. I said, "Mm, second greatest day. He says, what's the first? I went through the gospel. Did you know with his two artificial knees, he fell on his knees on the floor. He says, I have never. He says, none of that's ever. He says, says, I'm in the Lutheran church. My parents paid for the whole thing. He says, no one ever told me that. I said, I just did. God has been wanting you to know that. It was so sweet. That couple, she ended up being saved. He had never been saved. She wept. She knew where I was going with the second greatest day thing. Did you know, take anybody and counsel them, but what you say is, show them everything Christ can do, but say, you know what? The only way you can get in on this is by getting saved. Okay, 
next page, and then we're going to start going on our homework. We, we aren't finishing this lesson this week. That's why we're taking a month. Even though eternal life is a gift, many reject it. That's in the box. And then see all these verses. You can look it up. Um, if you do not already have sincere, and then in parenthesis, he often does this, he defines the word guileless, pure, or genuine. By the way, the word sincere is two words, uh, sine and chere. It's Latin. Sine means without, and chere means wax. You say, what does that mean? When you buy things made of marble in, in unilluminated shops in the first century, you could get a piece that's cracked, and the shopkeeper could have taken wax and filled the crack in, and wax on marble, you can't even tell it's there, and so you would buy a, a cracked vessel, but you couldn't tell it, and so people got taken so many times, they would go into the shop, and they'd say, excuse me just a second, and they'd walk out, and they'd hold it up like this to the sun to see the cracks and see if they were filled in, and so it got to be that people would put sine cherry. We don't put wax on our, on our marble carved objects. And that's sincerity means that you're not hiding. You're, you're not uh, hiding the, the defects. You're, you have a sincere, open before the Lord, personal relationship. And you have a spiritual problem that only God can solve. Without this relationship to Jesus... And then you just go through with the person. This is, this is part, did you know, I actually do, this is, when I counsel someone, this is where I start. And I go through and I just keep working in. Did you know you were born hopelessly separated from God? If they say no, they're probably not saved. Because a saved person realizes they were hopelessly separated. Do you realize you were spiritually dead? that you were hostile to God? Did you know a lot of people have heard a defective gospel? They've heard a gospel that, that you know, you're not so bad, and why don't you try Jesus, see if it works. That, that isn't how the Lord presented the gospel. And that's a defective... Now, people can get saved even with fragments of the gospel. But to truly understand what Christ did, you have to go through Ephesians 2. You who are dead... Uh, in your, your trespasses and sin. The God of this world, the devil, is controlling. You have to understand what the scriptures say. We're blinded by Satan. That's why people can't understand the Bible. Did you know one of the things, I have people, remember I've been pastoring for 35 years. I've had people call me up and they'll say, hey, I want to talk to you. I'm not getting anything on the Bible. I say, set an appointment with them. And they come in and they say, you know what? I can't understand the Bible at all. You know why? Unless they're saved, they can't understand the Bible. They're reading somebody else's mail. Right? The Bible's written to believers. And, and so they don't understand it. And so you have to explain to them it's spiritually discerned. The natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God. Also, people are held captive by him to do his will. This is a very nice passage right here. It says, you have to realize that people are going to come. 2 Timothy 2 says, people are going to come with problems, and they don't even realize that they are captives. They're coming in with shackles on, and they don't even see them because the devil has shackled them to their sin. And only Christ can break their captivity, and you have to explain that to them. They're powerless to overcome sin's hold on their life. Uh, they're unable to understand the things of God. Again, uh, that's this verse. The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. They're unable to please God. See, the bottom line, Paul said in, uh, and I don't think it's in this list of verses, but Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4.1 that the goal of teaching the new church was that they were supposed to learn how they were supposed to please God and walk in his way. They're incapable of living a spiritually fruitful life. See, apart from the Holy Spirit, you can't bear fruit that pleases God. So what is God's answer to your spiritual problem? It's to understand his character. And that's why we're taking eight lessons to talk about this. Because if you believe right, remember, if you believe right, then that leads to behaving right. See, belief 
gets the behavior straightened out. But the behavior can be wrong until you correct the believing part. And even, even Christians cannot believe uh, correct. In fact, a lot of people don't even know doctrine. Uh, and so they're just kind of, um, they have a little bit of good housekeeping, a little bit of you know, Dr. Spock and uh, you know, whoever else, uh, Oprah. You know? uh, and, and they just kind of, it's a smorgasbord. And that's why we have to realize God's answer is based on his character. So understanding, in fact, Rod uh, uh, was telling me that, Rod Frank, that, that he's teaching in the life groups, he's going through the doctrine of the communicable attributes of God. And he said he did one lesson in the whole life group, said that was the most astounding thing I've ever heard. You know what it is? The more we understand God's character, the more it transforms us because he wants that character on us. Okay, it's time for us to go to our discussion, so we'll pick up right here next week next week. Now let's go to what we're supposed to do for homework. So let me get here. Um, verses, just a second. Uh, Bible marking. The first few months are the hardest, the most verses. Remember, you're supposed to mark the verses you come to about every other one. Now look at this. The more you mark them, whoop, I can't, sorry, I can't write on, uh, forgot, I can't write on keynotes. The more you mark them, and note them the more you get out of this course. Now you say, what do you mean by note? Real quickly, I'll tell you this. When you highlight in your Bible, there are two ways you can do it. Some people want to have like 30 different colors of highlight. Good, do it if you want to. I'm too simple for that. I would be highlighting at Starbucks and have the wrong color. You know, and it would frustrate me and I would stop. And so make your own system. But what I did, remember, with me, it has to be simple. If it gets too complicated, I can't do it. So I use one color. But I just write what it is in my Bible. Like it's a verse about money. Or it's a verse about anxiety. Or it's a verse about bitterness. Or it's a verse about lust. And, and I'll even write what Broger said is the way you apply it. And I just, I just write it in my Bible. And I don't care what color ink I use. But the verse I highlight in one color. Now, if you want green for growing and red for redemption, good. Do it. Make your own system. Whatever makes sense to you. And so people have asked me, what color should we highlight? Whatever color you want. How many colors? As many as you want. See? Whatever makes sense to you. Be creative. Now, next, that's Bible marking. Verse memory. Uh, there, there are many ways to memorize the Bible. One man memorized the whole New Testament. His name is Ron Hood. He's an evangelist down in the southern states. He memorized all 7,900 verses of the New Testament. He, the first day, said it 25 times out loud. The second day, 20 times. Third day, 15. Fourth day, once. And then he said it once a day for the rest of the month, out loud. And he's never forgotten those verses. Uh, he, what he said is, an epinephrine trail, a groove got formed in his mind by saying it over 75 times in one month, period, out loud. Uh, that works because I, he came and spoke when I was in seminary. And uh, in seminary, we had to learn several hundred verses. So I tried this. And I, I learned a verse a day using this method. But it's very tedious because people think something's wrong with you because you're mumbling out loud all the time. You know, you just sit there going, in the beginning was the word and words with God, and the word was God, the same as in the beginning with God. You know, you're counting on your fingers and your toes. You're going, you know what I mean? It's tedious, but it works. The other is the flu method, first letter of each word. And, and what you do is you just, you know, F for God, G, so, S, loved, L, the world. So you go each letter. And on one side of the card, you have the first letter of each word. On the other side, you have the verse. And you look at it, and then you look at that, and all of a sudden your mind associates the two, and so you can learn it. What is the very best method for verse memorization? It's kind of like the best exercise machine. It's the one you use. You ever heard that? You go into the exercise store, and you say, what's the best machine for uh, exercising? And the salesman always says, one you'll use. OK, what's our homework? And this is what we're going to discuss for the last 10 minutes around the table as we get to know each other. Work on your verses daily. Pick up one of those rings over there with verses on it or whatever will work for you. Work through lesson one in your student workbooks. Tonight you're getting them. Those big fat books, right, are the workbooks. Let me explain. Can I use yours, Barb? 
Let me explain what the purpose of this big fat workbook is. The big fat workbook is for you to take the whole course without a teacher. You can actually do everything with this and the syllabus. You can do it all on your own. You can actually self-instruct. This has everything in it, and you just fill in the blanks by studying the syllabus. So you can do the student workbook, which is what this is, or you can just do, and let me go back to the lesson, uh, and I'll show you what I mean by this. Um, if we go to the end of this lesson, notice it has what's called a homework session. Homework, there we go. Uh, let me show you the exact homework. This, this is the second way. Either you can do this book, which is absolutely doing every detail of the course, and it's full of full in the blanks and stuff, or for those that, that have trouble toting this with them, and they've, see, if I had to have this with me, if I had forgot it one day, I wouldn't do anything because I didn't have it, because I like to have whatever you're supposed to have. So the other way you can take this course is to have your own little, all you need is your Bible and something to write in. And on, on the first day, um, you go, let me get to the first day and show you what you do. On the first day, tomorrow, you open a prayer and you, you read the biblical principle you can change. And in your own words, you write out Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and you close in prayer and you carry the card with you all day long. This takes, you do this at home, this takes about five minutes uh, Whoop, won't let me write on there. Then the next day, you pray, and you read another section, and you highlight the verses. You see, it's, it's, if you do this form, it's much simpler than this. But it's designed, some people don't feel like they're really in the course unless they're doing a lot of work. And that's what this is for. Some people feel like, and I talked to one of them tonight, and he says, I think I'm quitting. It's already too hard. You've got to do this method. Uh, it's very simple. This is the 12 minute a day. You, you just read the book about four pages at a time and you go on. And then uh, you, keep, you keep going. See the fourth day, you read this change and, and you, you memorize, start working on the verse. And uh, somewhere down here you have to write your testimony out. And that's all you do. So your homework for this class is to pick one of those two methods. Let me get back and then uh, pick one of those two methods, either the student workbook, which is harder, or get your own journal and Xerox that page out and do what it says. That's the second part of your homework. The third part is stay on this grow thing. You're getting into the word daily. Now, the best thing to do is to actually use this course for your devotions. So you look up all those verses and you pray over them. Reach out to the Holy Spirit. Did you know, unless as you're doing this, you're saying, Lord, I need your help. Unless you're doing that, you get very discouraged. Open to the sanctifying uh, word. In other words, saying, Lord, I want to do what these verses say. I'm not just learning this academically. I ask you to change me. See, if we get in the habit of reaching out and saying, apart from your strength, I can't do anything, and I want you to change me. When we start reading these verses, and when it says, let the peace of God rule in our mind, and we're in anguish with areas of our life, all of a sudden we'll say, wait a minute, I should let the peace of God rule in my mind over that, over my boss, over my debt, over my person that won't pay me back, you know, I'm so mad at. Uh, then that's surrender. So we need to do our devotions, pray, and surrender. Then willingly look for others to nurture. Did you know that people will come to us? I told you, I think on Sunday, that I was down at PNC Bank, and I was doing something, and the person kept looking at me and finally said, you're the one that did the funeral. I said, yeah. And they started asking me questions. By the way, it was after five. I think they didn't mind talking on company time. They said, I have questions. And see, what we have to do is be willingly looking for others to nurture. And I said, you know what? I'll sit here as long as you want. You know, you're the banker. And I started answering their questions. 
Because once, once we are in the word and reaching out for his power and asking him to change us, did you know the Lord starts putting people into our life that we can be a part of their spiritual pilgrimage? So we have exactly now five minutes. So we're better than last week. We had uh, less time last week. In your tables, turn around and just get to know each other. That's all you're supposed to do tonight. And table leader, collect those cards, okay? And you can stay as long as you want, but get your kids on time.